Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, this is Cynthia Wilkerson. I'm the Lands Division Manager for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Welcome to, um, and thank you for coming to uh, hear about our recreation strategy for DFW managed lands. Um, I am here with Joel Sislak, our Recreation and Planning Manager. Um, we are gonna wait just a couple of minutes for people to get, um, get on board here. And while we're doing that, um, we're going to put up a quick, a quick poll just to learn where you all are from. Um, we're all trying to make this a tiny bit interactive um, and informative um, in, the, in the kind of odd virtual setting that we have where we can't really see all of your faces, but maybe we can learn a tiny bit about um, where you're all coming from. So please uh, click on that poll and we'll share the results in a minute or two. If you're just joining us, we hope that, uh, well, welcome and thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. And we hope you take the quick poll that's there. And I think we will, um, in the next minute, we'll probably um, close that, share the results and um, get going with the, with the discussion here. All right, I think the poll is now closed and here's our results. Um, we got some pretty, you know, we, we hit all the areas, um, including, um, including uh, outside of the state. So thanks everyone once again for being here today. Um, really great to see um, people from um, all over uh, joining us today and thank you for your interest in WW Managed Lands and spending some time learning about our 10-year strategy uh, for recreation on those lands. Um, we're excited um, to be sharing this with you all. Um, and here's what we're gonna be going through. Again, I'm Cynthia Wilkerson, the Lands Division Manager at Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of introductory um, work here and then going to hand it off to Joel Sisolak, our Recreation and Planning Manager, who's going to take us through an overview of the draft strategy itself. Um, we'll be emphasizing then near-term actions, addressing a few frequently question, asked questions that we have um, heard, and then have time for question and answer and other questions. You can use the Q&A function of the, of the Zoom to be able to submit those. Um, and after that, those questions, then we'll talk about next steps. Um, and that's what we've got on the, uh, on the agenda for the day. So looking forward to it. Um, and I think we'll just get started. So thanks again for your interest in um, WDFW Managed Lands. Um, we manage lands throughout the state um, in service to our mission, which is here to protect to preserve, protect, and perpetuate fish, wildlife, and ecosystems while providing sustainable fish and wildlife recreation and commercial opportunities. 
Um, to that end, uh, we welcome around 30 million visitors uh, a year to our land system, um, which covers uh, over a million acres. You can see them on the map on the next slide. Um, over a million acres um, distributed throughout the, the state and over 450 water access areas. So we are in kind of every, every um, county in the state and um, offer a really diverse range of um, habitats and various opportunities to explore. Next slide. So we manage these lands. Um, we, uh, the, these lands are for protecting land and water for wildlife and people. And our vision on them is a Washington where fish and wildlife thrive in healthy habitats and where people experience and enjoy our state's natural gifts for generations to come. So um, in order to do that, we utilize active management so that we can provide access for fishing, hunting and other wildlife related recreation. So we can foster experiences and exploration of these places. And of course, preserve our natural and cultural heritage throughout the state. I always find it helpful. Um, people make assumptions about where the money comes from to manage our lands. And so um, I have two slides for you. One is uh, the uh, operating budget for our wildlife areas and one is for our water access areas. They are funded slightly differently um, in terms of percentages and amounts. Um, and so as you can see here, quite a bit, nearly a third is comes from general fund from the state legislature. Um, a bit over a third comes from federal sources, um, primarily Pittman Robinson funds, but quite a bit from Bonneville Power Administration and a couple of other sources. Um, and then uh, Wildlife State, the 15% there is from our uh, licenses uh, for fishing, uh, fishing and hunting. Um, and then there's some small amount of Discover Pass um, and some private local um, for things with uh, local uh, PUDs and mitigation, that kind of thing. Um, that one important thing I, I wanted to mention is that that was operating budget and our forest health work is, is funded at the tune of around $3 million a year through our capital budget. Um, so the number itself is a little bit bigger than that. Um, and then our water access areas. So the overall number is, is quite a bit smaller, but the distribution is, is also different. So a nearly half funded by Discover Pass, um, a bit over uh, a third um, from federal funding. The bulk of that is actually Dingle Johnson um, through, um, so Pittman Robinson is, is um, excise tax associated with um, um, hunting, so guns and ammunition. The Dingle Johnson, it has to do with a federal excise test related to fishing equipment. Um, and then the wildlife state again from our licenses. So just give you a sense of that. Um, those are based on actual expenditures. Um, and I think with that, I am going to hand it over to Joel. And I think at the same time, we're gonna open our second poll. So while he's talking about um, the changing landscape, as the background, you can um, quick let us know uh, any of the multiple uh, potential uh, acti recreation activities that you enjoy. So welcome, Joel. Thanks, Cynthia. Good morning, everyone. Um, while you're taking this poll, just wanna introduce myself really quickly. So uh, as Cynthia mentioned, I am the Recreation and Planning Manager for WDFW Managed Lands. And I also just want to share that this particular topic of outdoor recreation is near and dear to my heart. Um, I have family members who hunt, um, fish, hike, camp, etc. So we love this stuff too. I was also, um, I was raised by a biologist, so I also have a love for the for the um, outdoors and nature in general, which hopefully um, I can bring to this work. So we'll hold the poll open for a second. Um, I guess I can start just by talking a little bit about how the landscape is changing for outdoor recreation in the state. Uh, clearly the growth of the population itself, where we have, um, I think, 
currently uh, 7.7 .7 million people in the state of Washington. That's growth of about a million in the last uh, decade. And we anticipate more, I think another million probably in the next decade. So we continue to grow uh, more than 90% of Washingtonians report recreating outside. And that number was before the pandemic. I think that number um, is even greater right now. We did uh, uh, some work recently looking at um, the visitation numbers for DFW and other state lands and found that um, to no one's surprise, the number has gone up pretty significantly for WDFW managed lands. And as Cynthia mentioned, that includes the wildlife areas and water access areas. We're currently seeing visitor use of about 30 million visits annually. Um, certainly the greatest majority of those are to water access areas. We know a lot of people are coming to DFW managed lands um, to get to the water, whether it's to boat or um, fish or swim, et cetera. Uh, I think we can probably, let me look at this poll result, um, have a really good spread of uses here on the call, which is uh, great to see. Appreciate you all showing up for this um, and representing the various interests that you or activities that you enjoy. So we have um, a lot of people who camp and hike seem to be the two highest uses. Um, birding, nature viewing. Uh, we also have quite a few people on representing motorized recreation, which is great. It's an area, important um, part of the opportunities that people enjoy on DFW Managed Land. So I think we can go ahead and close the poll. Thanks. Um, so that was fun. So thank you for participating in that. Um, we do know that the recreation uses of public lands in the state are shifting. Um, DFW is best known, I think, for hosting uh, hunting, fishing, and wildlife viewing. And you know, that's kind of our, our long-term legacy, and it's also our on, ongoing commitment. One of the questions we'll address later that we've heard from some folks is why isn't this particular strategy more about hunting and fishing. And um, wanna say right off the top that our commitment to those uh, activities hasn't diminished at all. If anything, we hope that this strategy will uh, improve hunting and fishing opportunities and wildlife viewing. But we also know that um, as this graph shows, hunting and fishing are not the highest um, demands on public lands in the state. The largest number of people uh, want to hike or walk, and certainly those are done while hunting and fishing and doing other things. But hunt, walking, um, nature activities, swimming, um, camping, these are what more and more people want to do, even while activities like hunting and fishing have steadily declined in the state, particularly hunting. Um, We've also seen shifts in not only in recreation preferences, but how frequently people participate in the things they love. We're moving more and more from a user profile that's about um, really hardcore use or people who are, you know, their recreation is really part of their lifestyle. Maybe it's part of their family tradition and they're out there every week uh, week in, week out, sometimes a couple times a week. More and more, the profile of people visiting DFW managed lands are um, what I would call more casual recreationists who are traveling to public lands maybe once or twice a year. And the difference there, um, I think this maybe this is a little bit obvious, but folks who recreate all the time, tend to have more knowledge and experience doing what they do. More casual users often need a little bit more direction, support, um, 
and just greater clarity on where to go and how to recreate uh, safely and responsibly. Um, recreation during COVID, we did see a big jump, uh, particularly in the first year, I think, of the pandemic. We closed lands a bit for a while, just like as everyone was going home, so were the people who manage DFW lands. And um, I'm really grateful for groups like the Recreate Responsibly Coalition and, and others that helped us work with people in the recreation communities, uh, respond to the openings and closures um, and help keep everyone safe. But we did see a huge number of people escaping their homes into the outdoors. And I think at some level, we're still responding to the impact of that. We also, um, though we may have, you know, maybe it was a bit of a spike and we may see more of a return to the mean. We're already seeing numbers, I think this year, higher than um, before the pandemic. So we do think that the lasting impact of that high use uh, is going to continue. And then lastly, just another reality that we're facing as land managers, um, as recreation managers, are the impacts of climate change. Um, yeah, the fire season is particularly impactful on recreation, both the closure of lands for wildfire management, the, um, the impact of those wildfires on habitat and on places, and then also the smoke. Um, I think this year was a little lighter than previous years in terms of smoke, um, but that's in a little bit, that's just a kind of a luck of which way the winds were blowing. And I think we're gonna continue to see impacts from fire particularly, uh, and then also in terms of snow-based recreation, we have a lot of folks who like to ski, um, snowmobile, um, ride fat tire bikes on snow, et cetera. Um, and we know that you know the snow season precipitation patterns are changing. We anticipate um, less snow at, low, at lower altitudes and also um, in some areas, more rain. So all of these things directly impact um, recreationists directly and also agencies like DFW that are managing recreation. The other reality that we really are trying to, we're really wrestling with uh, in this rec strategy is the impact of outdoor recreation on wildlife, um, most focused, I think, kind of in the terrestrial realm for this plan. So uh, what are the impacts on trail use, on dis of dispersed use, all of these um, increases that we're seeing in just the volume of recreation activities on wildlife, both in terms of wildlife disturbance, so um, interactions with wildlife directly, and then also of the impacts of outdoor recreation on habitat. And I'll talk more about how we might go about measuring and mitigating for those um, as we go along. So getting into the strategy itself, there are three primary goals. Um, I really feel like there are two primary goals that will really indicate our success in this endeavor um, on two fronts. One, we want to protect natural, cultural, and uh, tribal resources better than we currently are. So we want to improve habitat. We want to improve protections for cultural and tribal resources. And we want to enhance recreation. And what I mean by enhanced recreation, um, provide quality recreation experiences, um, make recreation available to more diverse populations, et cetera. I really think that we can improve in both these areas simultaneously. Uh, I think there's a misperception out there that 
it's a bit of a, a zero sum game. Either you protect habitat or you enhance recreation. The intent of the strategy is to do both through better management and planning. And then the third goal on the slide is about strengthening relationships. This is really, um, this is elevated to one of the three goals in part because it's so critical as a means to success in meeting the first two. One thing that the department is really clear on is that we can't do this alone, that we're going to require partnerships, ongoing partnerships with um, our government partners, at, you know, tribes, other state land managers, federal agencies. Uh, we need to continue to build collaborative and stronger relationships with NGOs and um, recreationists themselves. The, the success of our ability to continue to offer quality outdoor recreation experiences directly relates to participation of the recreating public in helping to steward and preserve these lands for future generations. The 10 year recreation strategy for DFW managed lands has six strategic initiatives. I'll just read them now and then we'll go through each one briefly. Use and impact monitoring, regional and local planning, statewide and local rulemaking, travel management, education and engagement, capacity and funding. So kicking it off with use and impact monitoring, uh, one thing that or better data is really foundational to making good science-based decisions about uh, management of outdoor recreation and, and planning in the context of conservation. So this, you know, some of this work is already underway. You know, we need to know better how many people are coming, what they want to do when they get there, um, what their preferences are, et cetera. And we've started this work. Uh, we have a report coming out pretty soon, right, Cynthia, that from a contractor named Earth Economics. Earth Economics has been working with uh, RCO, uh, WDFW, Parks, and DNR to get a better estimate of the number of visitors to DFW managed lands and, and other state lands. And when I said earlier that you know, our latest estimate is around 30 million visits per year. That's a result of that work. Um, impact monitoring is also something that we're really committed to. And it's one of the near-term priorities, which I'll talk about more later. We really need a better handle on um, what are the impacts of greatest concern from you know, habitat, wildlife perspective, fish perspective, as well as a tribal perspective, um, cultural resource perspective. What are the research, what are the impacts of greatest concern? Um, and then how do we measure them? Uh, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence of impacts of recreation in various parts of the state. And some of those impacts um, have been pretty devastating, but we don't have a consistent way of measuring and monitoring those impacts, both for the sake of mitigating them as well as for the, for the purposes of adapting our management as um, some of those impacts are addressed. So we'll talk more about that. But that's going to be really critical. And it's, um, you know, we're looking at different methodologies for impact monitoring. And we hope part of this will include engaging members of the public, maybe with something as simple as a smartphone application, where you can help us uh, keep an eye on um, not just impacts to natural, cultural, and tribal resources, but impacts to the facilities that we're trying to manage so that um, people have a great experience when they come to DFW Manage Lands. Recreation planning. We're looking at planning at a variety of scales. And as with the impact monitoring, this is another area that we wanna 
partner with our fellow land managers, um, Washington State Parks uses a land classification system as part of their park planning model. DNR uses a model um, that we've also used with them at times called suitability mapping. Both of those methodologies um, are would contribute to what we want to do more of, which is more clearly assign particular uses in particular seasons on the landscape uh, in a, as a way to um, concentrate use where the land is more durable, to um, move some concentrated use away from more sensitive areas, and um, also just um, hopefully address some of the conflicts among uses. It would be taking both of the, both the DNR and the parks models use essentially a zoning process that we're, we're looking to adopt uh, for our purposes. Uh, we're also looking at um, more landscape level planning for some specific uses, whether that's developing trails um, or roads, just uh, recalling that we have some OHV enthusiasts on the call. You know, part of the intention would be to um, create uh, better systems, better maintained systems um, for different trail uses, including motorized use. Um, and then uh, other areas like target shooting, um, what else, signage, et cetera, all these things would benefit from more consistent planning models at the landscape scale. Rulemaking, as a general rule, we tend, we, we try to lead with education. I think um, some amount of the impacts to public lands come from a lack of knowledge uh, on the part of the users on how to recreate safely and responsibly. Um, so we always try to lean into education, but there are some areas that we need to strengthen our rules. One of the priority areas is the creation and use of undesignated roads and trails. We have a, a challenge, and I'll talk more about this under travel management. We have a challenge where um, we can't keep up with the number of roads and trails that users are creating on DFW managed lands. Um, we need to be able to focus more resources, energy, attention to the designated routes um, so that those are better maintained and clearly marked, et cetera. So one of the areas for statewide rulemaking would be hopefully to stop uh, the creation of rogue trails. Camping, we're looking at um, potentially shortening the maximum allowed stay. Um, we're looking to have a rule around cutting standing trees, clarifying rules around stream bank easements to make sure that we are honoring the rights of property owners, but also making those areas available, particularly for fishing, dog presence and dog training, um, and sometimes the conflicts between those things and drones. These are some of the high priority issues that have surfaced through conversations with our enforcement, um, as well as land managers around the state. We also are looking at expanding a system of more area specific rule making. We know that we don't need to take a statewide approach for managing every local issue. Uh, all of the lands that we manage tend to be very different and the issues are different uh, based on use patterns, the habitat itself, et cetera. So we wanna expand our capacity to do area specific rulemaking 
so that we're um, taking a bit more of a surgical tactical approach to addressing local issues. One of the questions that we've been getting in response to the strategy, and I was gonna address this later and maybe I'll address it later too, but um, is around camping. You know, there's a, there's a portion of this section of the strategy that talks about camping and um, limiting it to where it's designated. What we intend by that is not to say that you can only camp in hardened sites that are established campsites. What we mean is part of this area specific rulemaking, making it clearer what wildlife area units, wildlife area units, um, or wildlife areas generally allow camping and which ones don't, so that people can plan their trips before they get to a place and find a sign that says you can't camp on this wildlife area. We want to have that information centrally available so that um, there's no question when people head out on their adventures. And uh, um, we'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. Travel management. We have about 1,700 miles of road on DFW managed lands. Um, some of those are owned by other entities, by counties, et cetera. But there are about 1,300 miles that are owned and operated by the department. We have about 211, 211 miles of designated trails on DFW managed lands, including um, soft natural surface trails for non-motorized use. We don't have clear policies for roads or trails um, and their management on DFW lands. And that's, uh, that's something that we really need to tackle early. And fortunately, there are some good models we can use. Um, the Forest Service has done a lot to establish maintenance levels for roads and trails. DNR uh, has some good work around that. So um, we have some good information to draw on. But before we even start managing roads and trails more actively, we need to know what's out there. So one of the key early steps will be part of the in, an inventory and assessment of the use and condition of travel networks. And um, this is very closely tied to the first slide about impact monitoring. Um, and it, you know, that could very well have gone in that section, but because we have a travel management section, it's here. We need a better inventory and assessment of what's out there. And we need to establish uh, maintenance levels and maintenance schedules for the designated routes that are on DFW lands. And that, um, that maintenance and monitoring is part of the monitoring and managing travel networks. So education engagement, like I said, when I was talking about the rulemaking, we try to lead with public education and engagement um, in terms of helping people make good decisions on the lands. Um, but this is also, this slide's also about making sure that um, all the people who want to recreate who are in the state are able to, um, we know from polls that were done not too long ago that the vast majority of visitors to DFW managed lands um, are overwhelmingly white males over the age of 35. And um, as a person in that demographic, I, you know, I, I, we do appreciate the people who are currently coming to recreate, um, but we also know that that demographic, which is also tends to be a little wealthier than the majority of the state, doesn't reflect the diversity of folks in the state. So we wanna have, um, do some work to talk with and work with um, historically excluded communities to make sure that they can also enjoy these lands. Um, we also want to uh, continue to support hunting and fishing. The department in another sort of 
semi-parallel effort is creating an R3 strategy. R3 stands for recruit, retain, and reactivate, which is part of a nation, nationwide, probably inter international effort um, to recruit, retain, and reactivate people who enjoy hunting and fishing. That agency-wide approach, we also want to make sure we're applying on DFW managed lands. Hunting, hunting and fishing is um, that the department manages is bigger than the DFW managed lands, uh, but we certainly want the DFW managed lands to be contributing to the success of the R3 plan. Interpretation, we want to um, do a better job of telling the story behind the places that we manage, and that can come in a variety of formats. But basically, we want to share the his, natural history, cultural history, tribal history, and also share information about the important work that's going on on some of these lands to restore habitat for the people of the state. So um, interpretation in the, in, on this slide is, is not as much about translating from one language to another, but it's really about storytelling with the understanding that um, you can engage people's minds and hearts about a place through story. And hopefully people whose hearts and minds are engaged are going to want to help protect these places for, for their children and grandchildren. Um, engaging volunteers and supporting recreation needs, you know, there are a variety of ways to do that. We're, we're looking at what's essentially a, um, a trail hosting program, we're looking at citizen science, so engaging people who are visiting for recreation to also take down some data on habitat conditions or, or if they've seen a particular species. Um, equipping local managers to manage conflicts. Our belief is that a lot of the conflicts that happen on public lands are very local. And if we have um, personnel with the skills to help facilitate dialogue among groups, we think that we can address those issues locally as well before they blow up. And then finally, um, I've talked about educating visitors and how and where to recreate responsibly. You know, better signage is something we're working on, um, better centralization of information, but also continuing to work with partners like the Recreate Responsibly Coalition in, um, educating visitors on how to stay safe and, and how to keep other people safe and the land protected. Last slide about um, the strategies, capacity and funding. All of the work that uh, Cynthia and I are describing today take resources. And we know that our current capacity is really stretched already doing what they're doing. Uh, to manage the land, to enforce existing rules, um, to work with the public. This strategy is an ambitious expansion of our work in this area, and it's going to require a ramp up of capacity um, over the course of the 10 years of this strategy. A lot of that capacity will need to happen out in the regions for people who are interfacing directly with the public. Um, some of it will be developing systems like the area specific planning models that I talked about and some of the rulemaking. Um, and then this is gonna need ongoing support. So I don't know, um, Cynthia, if you wanna talk a little bit about, I know we're gonna have this as part of the near-term priorities too. So, um, Maybe when we get there, you can talk a little bit about um, what we're doing currently around funding in this area. I lost my cursor, there it is. So near-term actions, making lands more welcoming. Um, I talked about um, work with historically excluded folks. Another area of focus for us is ADA accessibility. Um, I know something like 10% of the state's population has some kind of mobility 
affecting disability. Um, and one of our, our objectives, and I think the state's objective as a whole is to make outdoor recreation accessible to all. We also have um, an increasing number of folks in the state for whom English is not their first language. So continuing to work both in terms of um, our new science standards and guidelines, but also communications in general to make sure we're, meet, we're serving a multilingual audience. Um, one, I'm pretty proud to say that one small step we've made in this direction is that the draft of this strategy has also been published in Spanish. Um, and we've actually been getting a lot of great feedback from Spanish speaking uh, Washingtonians um, about the strategies. So we're, we're trying to grow and evolve in that way. Um, collecting and analyzing data. Like I said, this is foundational. It's an important first step to, we need um, information, particularly about how many people are visiting, what they're doing, and then how do we address impacts um, and respond to those impacts in a, in a uh, constructive, um, proactive way. Curtailing legal activity, this goes a little to the rulemaking. Um, the highest priority is really addressing the creation of illegal routes and trails, as well as um, migrating some of the area specific rules that we have out there on the landscape, mostly on signs uh, into the WAC um, through a public process. Learn by doing some of the planning models that we are working on developing, we wanna test uh, as a way to understand um, how they might work with our particular mission and some of our uh, particular lands. So we have a couple of pilots in the hopper. We're doing a recreation planning pilot in the Metow wildlife area out in Okanagan County. We are doing a water access area planning model uh, in region four, which is Northwest Washington. We're looking at a travel management um, planning model in the Columbia Basin. So we're, we're trying to learn um, by moving forward with some of these models in a, in a cautious way that gives us an opportunity to have kind of real, real life interactions with the public around these processes and also just to see how they how they work on the ground and how they might be adapted before we scale them up. And then um, ramping up capacity, we are working on um, funding. And I will say the near-term actions, these are all about the next, when I say near-term, probably the next two or three years. Uh, but some of this is happening right now. And Cynthia, I see you came off mute. Do you wanna talk a little bit about the budget? Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, thanks, Joel. Um, actually, I want to take one second to um, kind of give a little bit more of an introduction to myself, only because um, I meant to do that at the beginning and I missed out on it. Um, so again, this is, uh, there's just this interesting situation of being on the, the virtual, in the virtual world, and I'm kind of speaking, and the only person I get to see is Joel, but we're trying to at least um, you know, bring a little bit of, of uh, our humanness to the, to the conversation. So um, again, I am our lands division manager and I oversee and direct the work to acquire and steward lands for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, I've got connection, family connections to Washington that go back over uh, nearly 40 years. Um, my story is that we've all married Washingtonians, so I can tell you more about that story some other time. Um, but I'm particularly passionate about the connection between people and place. Um, and uh, the opportunity that um, experiencing a place gives um, in terms of, in particular, um, the power of nature to craft personal and collective identity. Um, I think we all know that, um, that the evergreen state um, embeds um, the, identi the identity of, of our natural places um, and experiencing them into our um, identity as Washingtonians. And I'm, I'm trained as a landscape ecologist, so I'm always looking for connections at that landscape level, um, but very much bring um, a social justice lens to that body of work. And my experience is deeply embedded in place-based collaborative landscape 
um, conservation efforts. Um, beyond that, I am a mom of two boys, 10 and 13. They keep us busy and active and we spend as much time outdoors together as possible. So we hike and uh, bike and backpack and camp. My husband's an avid hunter. Um, the whole fall is, is kind of all scheduled out. Um, and then we all do uh, some fishing um, and I've been dabbling in fly fishing recently. I'm still very much a learner. Um, so anyway, with that, I'm just very honored to be, um, to lead the team of land stewards throughout the state and really excited about this conversation and this body of work and the ramping up of the capacity. I feel like, you know, Joel talked a bit about um, really the more public visibility of public lands and the importance of public lands um, through COVID and, you know, the impact on public and, and uh, mental and physical health. And um, we've seen that recognition um, and we are pleased that it's getting some attention from the legislature um, some of the things in this plan have already been moving. And right now we have a couple of things that are promising in the, in the budgets. Um, we did get some money for some initial kind of staffing to service our wild water access areas um, as kind of a stop, stop gap measure for just one year, um, but followed that up with a longer term um, solution for staffing. So right now we have a $3.5 million budget request in that was fully funded in the House budget, um, partially funded in the Senate budget, but that would um, bring um, the majority of staffing for the boots on the ground, so nine water access area staff throughout the state, and then three additional uh, wildlife area staff, uh, one to uh, work on education and outreach associated with the Green Dot Road system um, in Chelan, Kittitas, and Yakima counties, one um, to support outreach associated with the target shooting range on the Weenas wildlife area in Yakima, and then another to support um, all the fishing recreation um, on the lakes and the Wooten water access area in Columbia and Garfield counties. Um, and then the centralized staff to do a lot of the work that you see laid out here in this plan. So things like um, a science staff to support the, um, the collection and, and analysis of data um, to inventory um, the various um, infrastructure, recreation infrastructure that we have, map them, be able to communicate them. Um, that's really critical and important. Um, a biologist to do the ecological integrity monitoring, um, to look at the impacts of recreation management and recreation use on ecological integrity to direct our adaptive management approach, which is hugely important. Um, rules, a rules coordinator to manage the body of work that we need to do to really um, bring the consistency at a statewide level and the clarity about what can be done where um, on our lands um, and to do that uh, in a quality way. And then uh, a, rec a recreation planner to have a dedicated planner working on recreation issues. Um, and two recreation coordinators, two, one on the east side and one on the west side, so to support um, the engagement of the public with recreational opportunities on our land. So those are all very, very exciting. One thing that you didn't hear me say was, um, was uh, enforcement. And that is only because um, our enforcement um, program is kind of capped out at their ability to recruit um, and so in future years, as we go through the 10 years and are expanding and meeting the, the overall capacity, we will be um, including enforcement needs in that. But right now they are continuing to ramp up at the pace that they can. Um, the other exciting thing that's happening with the legislature is a recognition of the, of the infrastructure backlog associated with managing recreation lands. And thank you to the Washington Trails Association and Trust for Public Land for supporting um, uh, some budget provisos that made it into both budgets um, uh, for DFW, DNR, and, and state parks, each of us getting $5 million a year for recreation infrastructure backlog. Um, in the Senate, it's ongoing. In the House, it's one time. Um, what I will say is that we have over a $40 million detailed list of our <laughs> infrastructure backlog, um, much of that having to do with recreation. And so um, 
any funds that we can get on, on an ongoing basis to address those will be very welcome and help um, improve the experience um, of Washingtonians that are looking to engage with uh, recreation on our lands. And I think that's what I had. Um, Joel, feel free to fill in anything I may have missed. No, that was great. Thank you, um, Cynthia. So I think at this point, you know, we have um, had the strategy out for public comment since um, at least the 1st of February. So, and it, the public comment period closes uh, on Monday, actually on the 28th, but it has been up for a while and we have been getting some questions. Um, so what, what we thought we would do is try to address some of the more frequently asked questions that we've heard before opening it up for more Q&A. Um, so I think uh, you know this first question about the focus, I started to address a little bit, but Cynthia, do you wanna say a little bit more about why this strategy doesn't focus more on hunting and angling? Yeah, sure, thanks, Joel. Um, well, so first and foremost, right, WDFW's commitment to fishing, hunting, and wildlife viewing remains strong and central to our identity as a department. It's an it's essential, it, it's the foundation of our mission and mandate. Um, so starting there, um, and for a long time, DFW has focused primarily on these dispersed uses, while other uses have, as we've seen, have grown in popularity and impact, and they haven't been adequately evaluated or managed on WDFW managed lands. Um, as Joel mentioned, there is one specific part of the strategy that explicitly addresses hunting and fishing, and that's the implementation of the R3 strategies on the lands that we manage. Um, so that will continue and that will be um, implemented uh, and integrated into uh, recreation management on our lands. And what we also know is that better planning and management overall uh, will support all recreation uses, including hunting and fishing. And by, by helping to keep habitat and species populations healthy and better managing to reduce uh, conflicts among users. So um, the commitment is remains strong um, and we also need to be kind of um, looking at the big picture and the connections between everything. Um, so with that, I think uh, Joel, I will pose the next couple for you. Um, so Joel, how will a policy about roads, trails, camping be closed and less open affect dispersed use and users? And just so you know, there are there's a, a few questions in already in the Q&A that kind of follow the same theme. Um, so and maybe um, maybe I will read them just so that kind of we can answer them as a suite maybe. Um, so there's a question, why is the closed and less posted open strategy used as a default? That seems the opposite of making our lands accessible. Um, there's a question, well, I'm not sure if that question is quite the same. So we'll ask it separately. Um, I'm just scanning through. I love that we're getting all these questions. Yeah, we've got a great, slew of questions to get through. This is excellent. Um, it may be that that actually is the only one. I think it might have been the first one. So maybe everyone saw it and figured it was already asked. Oh, wait. Um, actually, I'm finding another one. Um, it is my understanding that one of the intents of the plan is to switch from an open and less closed strategy to a closed and less specifically open strategy. How does this support the making access to DFW lands more welcoming goal? Okay, those so are I will, the ones. I, I'll um, I'll make some general comments and try to answer. And if I don't answer um, your question, please feel free to put it back um, up in the Q and A, and I'll try to do a better job when we get get to it. Um, I would just start with saying why we're doing this. You know, the, the intent is uh, a lot around um, our ability to address one of our biggest challenges. And, and that's, 
that's the challenge that I noted in the rulemaking section around the creation of rogue or unsanctioned roads and trails. Um, currently, our only real options for addressing these is to first find them um, and then post signs that they're closed and signs that can be taken down or shot up, which we see happen. Um, and then decommission them, which, you know, the cost to decommission, particularly a road per mile is pretty staggering. Um, so the, the intent is to first help support um, a rule that limits the creation of illegal roads and trails. So that's first. And um, the first area that we intend to work on is roads. We already have um, a system in the state, which Cynthia, I think you mentioned about the uh, green dot system in three of our kind of central state counties. And there, the green dot system, you know, there's a clear map of the lands that are available. There's uh, signage that guides people where they can go. And then there's also a clear statement that other than on that system, you know, there's no um, use, uh, that system as well as kind of the sort of general use roads, there's no motorized use. Uh, moving to something like that in other parts of the state is something that we're considering. For trails, you know, one thing that um, I want to say, I, I'm really grateful to particularly the hunting community for their response. Um, because, you know, looking at the draft, I think the language definitely needs improvement. Um, we don't expect people who are doing dispersed uses, whether that's hunting or shed antler hunting or gathering mushrooms or other activities to stay on trails um, that or doing wildlife photography, et cetera. Those activities by their nature require people to go off trail at times. Um, our current thinking is we will um, limit off trail travel to people on foot, unless there's some um, need related to disability for a special permit. We are uh, currently thinking that travel off of designated routes on foot will continue to be allowed. With, hunt, with camping, um, there's been a lot of concern, I think I said this earlier, that we're going to limit camping to hardened established campsites. And that's not our intent. Um, and again, I think this is an area where the language of the strategy can be improved and we're gonna work on that. What, we're, what the intention is with camping is pretty consistent with the way camping is already managed on DFW managed lands which is that there are some wildlife areas and some wildlife area units where camping is not allowed and hasn't been honestly for decades. And this is about uh, making it clearer in a centralized way, probably within the Washington Administrative Code um, where those places are. And then also clarifying what wildlife area units, what wildlife areas still allow camping. And what we envision um, is no big change from the current situation um, in the near future, or even maybe in the mid future, that um, where people are currently allowed to camp is likely to still be open for camping. And where people can't camp is likely to continue to be closed for camping. Um, it'll just be clearer and it'll be easier for us to manage those closures if it's clear to everyone um, where they are in a, in a centralized place. So those are the, those are some of the intentions around um, roads, 
trails and camping. So I don't know, Cynthia, how did I do? Did I, do you think I answered the questions about that in the Q&A too? Felt fairly comprehensive to me, Joel. Um, I guess um, what I would offer is that if you didn't feel like that fully addressed your question um, that I read aloud, then um, please uh, re-enter an additional question. Um, so with that, we're gonna continue on these two and then, we've, then we'll then we launch into the submitted questions. This one, I think again, is for you, Joel. How will you address impacts of recreation? Yeah, and... Um... A few parts of this. First, I will say collaboratively, uh, we we hope to work with other land managers, with tribes, and with the public, again to clarify what impacts are of greatest concern, figure out how to measure them, how to um, respond to them in a kind of an adaptive management manner, and how to be reporting out to the public about them. Um, so the first step is developing the framework for prioritizing and measuring the impacts of greatest concern. And this isn't just about impacts to natural, cultural, and tribal resources, that those, those are a major concern, but also impacts to facilities like roads, trails, restrooms, et cetera, boat ramps, to make sure that our maintenance levels are um, as high as they can be. So the um, if that was a probably bless, bless, blissfully short answer, but I mean, that's pretty good, pretty um, comprehensive too. So the next question, I think um, Cynthia, you could best answer, which is how are we working with tribes on um, managing recreation for DFW managed lands. Sure, happy to do that, Joel. Um, yeah, the, the tribal engagement is um, very critical to the way that we work across the board as an agency. Um, there are 29 federally recognized tribes based in the state of Washington and several more that have off reservation treaty rights as well. Um, in the state, uh, DFW's work with the tribes really begins with the acknowledgement that outdoor recreation and conservation in Washington occur on the homelands of native peoples and who have lived in this region from time immemorial and continue to live here. Um, DFW has a legal obligation to coordinate and consult with, the, with tribes under federal and state law. Um, we also have a an agency policy with regards to consultation. Anything including recreation that impacts tribal resources must be done with um, the initial consultation and then coordination. Um, so early in this process with the strategy, we sought input from the tribes. Um, and beginning in October of 2020, we convened a series of meetings um, with the tribes that was intended to get um, thinking to integrate into the REC strategy. Um, at, at, the, in, at the request of the tribes, we also invited uh, fellow land managers from state parks, DNR, US Forest Service um, to be part of the conversation. And so it was kind of a, a umbrella conversation about, um, about addressing recreation issues of concern to the tribes, um, including recreation impacts, including education and outreach and enforcement. Um, and as a result, the draft strategy that is out for review has really been greatly improved by the generous input of those partners. Um, and then the, uh, the intent uh, is that we will continue working with tribes as we move into the implementation of the strategy. Um, and that's really where a lot of the work remains and to develop and Im implement the policies and the tools and the processes that we'll be utilizing and implementing over the next 10 years um, and beyond. Um, so that, you know, kind of is how we've been engaging with the tribes and will continue to do so um, 
uh, and uh, we'll be, you know, as well, continuing to engage um, with, um, with interests such as all of yourselves. Did that um, address that question? Do you think, Joel, anything you had to add to that? No, I think that was that was great. Um, just clearly our commitment is ongoing. And I would say to everyone on the call that this strategy, this document doesn't make rules. It recommends rulemaking. Um, it doesn't make plans, it recommends planning. And all of those processes, whether it's rulemaking, planning, and some of our other, uh, the other recommendations in the strategy, all will have opportunity for input. Input from um, and collaboration with our tribal partners, <laughs> other, other government partners, public input, um, so I do want to take this sort of the short opportunity to tell people that, you know, there will be plenty more bites out of the, of the apple for people who want to engage in various aspects of the implementation of this REC strategy, which we expect to take at least 10 years. So it looks like we have some um, other questions that have come in. Yeah, Joel, great. so I would, um, what I'd like to do is I, I, I see a few that have some similar pieces to them. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull that out at first, and then I plan to just go down the line. And um, there, are, there are a couple of folks who put in multiple questions. So I think what we'll do is we'll do, you know, one per person first, and then go back to the ones that are multiples. Um, so... I'll kind of just manage through that and you know some of them you'll answer and some of them I'll answer. Um, uh, there's there's several questions kind of about the data and the numbers that we quoted um, in particular a question about the 30 million and then there's some question about um, the use numbers um, and where those come from. So um, I will I will address, so, so there's one question that says, and when looking at the 30 million user figure, are those COVID numbers, is that a spike or is that consistent? Do we expect the numbers of 2020 to 2022 to continue? How is that factored? I don't have graphs or, graphs or figures to look at, but I'm concerned when the discussion cites a number and we acknowledge that, that the past two years have been very unusual with regard to outdoor recreation. So. Um, I'll take a crack at this one, um, and then I think I'll uh, read the next data one for you, Joel. Um, so we worked, uh, as, as Joel mentioned, with Earth Economics um, and actually utilized um, a data set of anonymized cell phone um, pings. And so we were actually able to spatially locate like where people are going on state um, state managed lands, um, how much time they're spending there, um, things like use patterns of overnight visits versus days visits. Um, and that is where the $30 million figure comes. Um, that report will be out in the next few weeks. Um, and we're excited about that methodology just to give some kind of uh, some good uh, foundational um, information about the user base um, and, and numbers. Um, those, uh, those numbers in, in terms of the COVID question, we compared 2019 or 2020 to 20, 2019 to 2020. And um, for the state overall, um, the increase was 12%. I think the DFW figure went up 7%. Um, and while we do attribute that to COVID, um, there are indications that, that the experience um, of getting out some of the first time users um, has opened them up to wanting to experience that more often. So I, I can't exactly, you know, I don't have a crystal ball about how many people will continue to visit public lands, but um, we don't expect it to particularly slow down. Um, and you know, population in, in continues to increase as well. So um, that's that's that question. Um, do you have anything to add to the to that specifically, Joel? 
I mean, I might say that the um, the spike of use isn't necessarily uniform across the state. I think, um, and I I need I'm looking forward to digging more into the report, but I think some of the particularly the COVID related spike was more uh, areas close in to population centers saw higher jumps in use during COVID than some more remote areas. So it's a little bit, um, it's hard to kind of make broad statements about increase because some of it was very uh, place specific. Yes, okay. Um, there is a question about the other data, but it's sort of mixed in with other questions. So I think I might just go back up to the top if uh, that works. Um, so one question um, for you, Joel, do you intend to adopt a policy of closing public lands to the public? I am looking for this particular issue in your draft and cannot locate it. Um, I mean, I think the short answer is no. Um, you know, a lot of the funding that's used to acquire state lands and DFW managed lands specifically include uh, an assumption and, and actually a requirement for public access. I think um, you know, we will continue what we already are doing, which is you know, manage sometimes the timing of access or the kind of access and through planning and um, through public process. But in terms of like a broad policy to close public lands, no, we don't, we don't intend to do that. Yeah, and I would add that in general, um, the predominant, the vast predominance of our lands are open to the public. Um, we do utilize seasonal closures for resource issues at times. We have a small number of reserves um, on our lands where there is uh, no, no public use, but that is um, the exception rather than the rule. Okay. Um, uh, it was noted in the draft that partners and interested stakeholders were brought to the table to help provide insight for the draft. Was the motorized OHV ATV motorcycle community brought to the table? They are so often left out of this discussion at, and as shown in the poll, make up half the number of recreationists that are interested in this call. So I would start, I would just start answering that question um, by um, acknowledging that, um, that our first, so we, we worked with the tribe, tribal interest, and then we worked with, um, our wildlife area advisory committee. So we presented the body of work. Um, well, not only our wildlife area advisory committees, actually any advisory committees, um, which we have over 50 of in, in the agency, um, had uh, were invited to participate in, in a briefing si sort of similar to this um, and were sent the draft. Um, and that the, the representation it pretty much spans the full gamut of interests um, in our lands for sure and, and other things that the, that the department does. So that's one um, specific body of pretty broad outreach um, that would have touched those interests. Yeah, I would just add, you know, we, we also did um, briefings for the Big Ten which is a collection of outdoor recreation interests and that includes representation from ATVers for sure. Um, and then a couple of other kind of larger groups um, like the Recreate Responsibly Coalition and others. But I will also kind of put a request out there. And I say this, this question is from Anna um, Backlund hope I pronounced your, your name okay, Anna. Um, and I would say that particularly around some of the travel management work, I saw another comment, I think from someone who is in the, the motorcycle community about 
level of maintenance of roads and that, you know, some folks don't want highly maintained roads. Um, so what I would ask is that motorized recreation groups um, continue to engage with us, particularly when we get into more of the travel management phase of implementation for this strategy. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be reaching out too, um, but it's, it's gonna be a big, travel management's gonna be a big body of work and we definitely uh, want motorized recreationists at the table for those conversations. Okay, and again, I'm going to try to make sure that everybody who asked a question gets um, their question asked before moving on to multiple questions by the same person. So, um, and I apologize, I hadn't been um, in acknowledging the people who asked those questions, so I'm going to start doing that. Um, uh, so this question is from West, uh, sport fishing and hunting tags and licenses. I saw your pie charts. It has been known for a an, an great deal of time that this is an eight plus billion dollar per year industry and it climbs year by year. Does your calculations of population growth include immigration? And I believe that those, well, so the pie charts were about the fund sources and the population growth, I believe is from the SCORP, is that right, Joel? Yeah, I think that, um, and also from population growth, general numbers from um, the census. And the question about uh, does the calculation of population growth include immigration? The answer to that is yes. Um, the census cal uh, calculates population growth both through um, population growth in the state as well as in migration. So um, the last piece about sport fishing and hunting tags, I'm not sure I completely. I, I don't see it. I don't actually see a question there. So maybe Wes, if you have an additional question, you can add that in. Certainly um, outdoor recreation is um, a billion dollar industry in, um, in Washington state. Um, we know that from uh, recent research um, and um, yeah, absolutely that is true. And we are working to continue to acknowledge, have that acknowledged and support, you know, utilize to support the resources we need to, um, to provide the opportunities. So this next question is from Aaron, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, Hunters and anglers are required to pay license fees annually. Given the shift in focus and expenditure toward other forms of recreation, will practitioners of other forms of recreation, i.e. wildlife viewing, walking, also be charged high license fees annually? If no, why not? I'll, I'll start and then Cynthia, maybe you can. Uh, I, I, I will say that this is a question that um, comes up not just with DFW, but it's come up in the state as a whole for a number of years. I know that um, at least in one past legislative session, there was a bill that would have created a quote unquote backpack tax. Um, you know, what I'm, what I'm hearing a little bit in Arne's question is, you know, about you know, hunting and fishing has, uh, is paying through their licenses uh, for at least a portion of the maintenance of these lands. And where is the contribution from these other uses? Um, I don't have, just being really honest, I don't have a great answer to that other than to say that um, it is an ongoing conversation that is broader than just WDFW. I will say that um, we recognize that hunting and fishing, in addition to having um, licensing, are also more regulated than a lot of other uses in that you know, the seasons are very defined, the um, bag limits are very defined, 
and some of these other uses are much less regulated. So part of the intention of the strategy is to bring stronger management and some regulation to these other uses on DFW managed lands um, with the hope that that also will contribute to the experience of hunters and anglers. So Ann, I hope that helps. Um, yeah, and I would just point out too that the Discover Pass is a form that is paid by anyone accessing state lands. And if you have a hunting or fishing license, you do get a vehicle access pass um, included in that, in those fees, um, which you can use uh, in lieu of a Discover Pass on DFW managed lands. Um, so yeah, and I think that the larger question is, you know, we have been uh, working to uh, get more support from the general fund um, to, in recognition that this body of work uh, does benefit all Washingtonians. Um, and there have been conversations about different funding mechanisms. Uh, there's, you know, different taxes that could be implemented and utilized, like you said, the backpack tax. There's been talk about, you know, soda tax or, you know, different things. Um, but at this point, sort of the, the public momentum and support for those haven't come to fruition. Um, question from an anonymous attendee. Um, what is the plan to open or create roads for OR, more roads for ORBs? I think the easy answer to that question is that that would be covered in um, our planning processes so that this, this plan doesn't dictate that as Joel said, um, but it opens the door for um, place-based conversations and travel management plan conversations that would um, bring the, that, that would integrate that opportunity. Um, Trump Love 24 asks, if the WDFW decides to charge a fee for camping on public lands, will the discovery pass and the WDFW permit no longer be required? I mean, I don't think there's any immediate plans that I'm aware of to sell camping permits on DFW managed lands. I know that um, state parks does have a camping um, permit program, and I'm not sure how that truthfully interacts with their Discover Pass um, requirements, but there's nothing in this REC strategy that suggests that we're going to be start um, permitting camping. Um, Mike Sevigny asks, as you ramp up capacity, how will you ensure that non-consumptive recreation impacts will not negatively impact wildlife and their habitat? When will you create recovery plans for species and wildlife in areas where non-consumptive recreation has already degraded habitat and displaced species? So I think that a couple of things there, Mike. One is that um, we talked about the recreation impacts um, and looking at developing and implementing adaptive management with monitoring specific to the ecological impacts um, in a, on the ecological integrity. So uh, we will be developing that um, if all goes well with the resource asks that we have associated with being able to do that. Um, and then we do create recovery plans for all of our state listed um, species. And those are integrated into our wildlife area planning process. So we have, um, where applicable, uh, we have various goals and objectives associated with that on the wildlife areas with the understanding that um, for the most part, wildlife areas about, are about managing and um, restoring habitat and the, um, the species specific population goals are usually um, handled at a larger scale than the footprint of an individual wildlife area. Anything to add on that one, Joel? Okay. Um, Brian England from the Northwest Motorcycle Association asks, data is foundational, definitely agreed. 
I'm curious how the figures in the graphs are arrived at. It seems incredible to me that walkers comprise 94% of users. And is that someone walking a couple of times a year? How is the data quantified, not just categorically, but with respect to time and use? Um, and then more importantly, what are the financial contributions of the various user groups, both to WDFW and to the local communities? What are the monetary contribution of walkers, hunters, ORV? I know that has to be balanced against impact. So you wanna talk a bit about the score? Yeah, so the, um, the graph that Brian's referring to is the, I think that early one about use patterns. And that is from data from the 2017 SCORP process. The SCORP is um, done every five years. Uh, it's run by RCO to look at um, recreation needs across the state. The 2022 process is underway, so we'll have some new data on that soon. Um, and uh, in terms of how it's quantified, I think it's mostly people self-identify their uses with some identification of frequency of use. So it's not the most um, granular of data, but um, I think important. And then the financial contributions, I feel like we use, we address this a little bit um, with an earlier question about wanting, you know, hunting and angling, having license fees, um, other users have discover pass. I know ORV users also have some um, licensing fees, et cetera. So um, yeah, I appreciate, Brian, I appreciate your question. Okay. Um, Anonymous asks, the plan states several times that the number of hunters and anglers is declining and uses this for a justification of a shift in management priorities. And on page 12, it states that in 2020, licensed sales rose 16% and 40% from 2019 for fishing and hunting respectively. Can you explain how both of these statements are true? Thank you. Yeah, the, you know, the um, one of the big one of the areas of growth during the pandemic, if there's any silver lining to this awful thing that we've all been going through, is that hunting and fishing increase. And part of the um, part of the interest in the R three work is to try to capture some of that enthusiasm, though. Um, a little bit of dimming of that silver lining is that we've already seen a return, a returning to the mean um, in terms of hunting and fishing levels from pre-pandemic. So we have seen a big jump, um, but we've also seen kind of a return to the decline, even, even though the pandemic's not over yet. Um. So question from anonymous, anonymous attendee, is there a program I can be a part of to help me to help map the non-designated not motorized trails that need to be reviewed and monitored and help identify trails that meet the class of sustainable maintainable trail during the review process? Um, I, I think so, you know, if, if that person wants to reach out to me and maybe, um, Diane or Rachel, if you can put my email address in the chat, any follow-up um, from this person or anyone who wants to be involved um, or ask more questions about the REC strategy, because I think we're going to be running out of time soon, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, especially, like, I really appreciate this person's desire to help. Yeah, absolutely. And again, um, I do appreciate everybody being here and all of the questions. Uh, we aren't able to get to all of them, but trying our best. We've got another minute here. Um, there's a couple of questions about process. Will there be a public process for determining what areas are deemed closed to camping? And then there's another question. I would like to know what the process and plan to reopen any routes closed by the blanket approach 
mainly with formerly legal road trails that get classified as non-maintained. Is there a time frame for when analysis process would occur, which would be basically make them closely in, closed indefinitely like we've seen with the US Fish and Wildlife Service MVUM development? So I'm um, Rachel's typing an answer there. I think in general, it's good to remember um, that the specific actions will have their own public engagement process. Um, for either of those, Joel, is there something you want to add? Yeah, uh, it looks like Brian's looking for a time frame. Um, it is going to, you know, like I said, the travel management section is is pretty huge, and it's going to take a while. Um, so. Our intention is to continue to engage with groups, um, especially at a very local scale. Uh, as we get to parts of the state, we're gonna prioritize areas of the highest use or highest need first, but it is gonna take us a while to get to um, every route in the state. Okay, um, there's a question that one's again from and in Buckland, if there's a concern over migration or breeding grounds, why not institute a seasonal closure instead of full closures of our public lands? Central Oregon and many areas in Colorado successfully implement seasonal closures to help wildlife. And I, I would assert, Anna, that that's exactly what we also do. Um, and uh, we, we use those, you know, very, very specifically where we have, uh, we have that need. Uh, we have not instituted broad closures of, of our lands. Um, so it's 12.01, what would folks like to do? I wanna just give people a heads up of where the process is headed next. Um, also, of course, if people need to drop off, um, we welcome or encourage that. But I will just say that, you know, the public process ends um, the end of this month. And then we're going to be um, taking all the comments we've gotten in um, revising the draft. And we hope um, toward the end of March, the plan will be adopted. And then the adoption or the implementation, this is a 10 year strategy. The travel management piece, as we've said a couple of times already, is going to probably take at least 10 years, um, but we're going to start with the near-term priorities that we outlined. And um, as we ramp up capacity, we're going to continue to implement this strategy um, through at least 2031, 2032. I also just wanna make a quick plug um, for those of you on the call who like to recreate and also like to take pictures of yourselves and loved ones recreating, we are still developing the kind of the graphic design and, and layout of the strategy if you've reviewed the draft, you know it's all text at this point. We are hoping to uh, make it more interesting with photos. So please um, send us your photos that you're willing to share. And you know, we'll put um, at least some of the photos we get into the into the rec strategy. So with that, I mean I'm I'm happy to stay on and continue to address questions. Um, maybe we can do that for another. Uh, at least a few minutes, um, if that sounds okay to you, Cynthia. Yeah, there was just a question. Uh oh, I think it disappeared. It was a question from Travis, I think, who asked, can we get the data, the, um, the visitor use data? And I would say that what is available will be um, released in the next, uh, sometime in the next few weeks with the Earth, Economic, uh, Earth Economics report. Um, we don't have that in a shareable form at the moment. Um, I don't know what happened with that question, it disappeared. <laughs> I started to type an answer and then it was gone. Um, so again, just really thank you all for your interest and your engagement here today. Um, maybe one or two more of these, Joel, and we'll probably have to move on. Um, but there are a couple of specific um, 
you know, again from Anna, the ability to get involved in stewardship through volunteering is extremely difficult and disconnected. The WDFW would greatly would benefit greatly from help and closures may not be necessary. What measures are being taken to make volunteering and stewardship easier on WDFW lands? Um, again, we have an intent to do that. We haven't had the capacity really to manage a, a process and we are looking to get better. Um, so we would welcome you know, ideas on, on that as well um, as we, as we uh, ramp up our ability to um, to provide that engagement. Um, permitting was mentioned in the draft document for regulating recreation. What is meant by permitting? To what extent is permitting being discussed? Um, permitting is yet another barrier to access. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, I mean, permitting is a potential tool in the toolbox that I think, um, all land managers in the state are looking at. Um, I think the conversations are pretty early days, at least for DFW. So um, to Anna's question about the extent it's being discussed, it is being discussed widely and seriously. Um, but I think the timing on that um, and how that might uh, apply, if at all, on DFW managed lands is still very much TBD. I think in the REC strategy, we say that we're going to analyze opportunities for permitting. There's no immediate plan to apply permitting. Um, and then related to that, and then I, I know that there are a few people who have called in um, via phone and aren't able to see um, the email or the websites for info. So um, we will verbally speak those in just a minute. Um, related though was the question about how are the trails gonna be inventoried and evaluated? Um, some user created trails may be sustainable and should be kept. Um, how it sort of, it relates to, you know, what you're just saying, Joel, about utilizing volunteers. Um, I think we're definitely open to that. Um, we haven't created an infrastructure to manage that at the moment. So I would say we welcome it. Cynthia, there's a, there's a question here that maybe we can answer, then maybe um, wrap up. So this, this question is from Eileen Levy, um, who writes, as you've indicated, it's clear that people are accessing public lands irrespective of their intent. Is the plan to open more lands prior to establishing the necessary policing portion central to any successful land management, whether on private or public lands? Um, I feel like there are a couple of pieces there that I'd like to kind of pull apart. One is um, I am not sure, um, at least as I'm reading it, I would completely agree with that first statement that people are accessing public lands irrespective of their intent. Um, I, you know, we, we do want to better understand what people's intent is and what their interests are when they're coming to public lands. Um, and is the plan to open more lands prior to establishing the necessary policing portion? When I say the word policing, I, I think of enforcement. Um, and Cynthia mentioned earlier that, you know, our enforcement vision uh, is kind of on this ongoing mission to recruit um, more officers. And it's, it's a difficult process and it takes time. So the intention is to continue with recruitment um, and to continue with, uh, with our land management. And some of that might be on newly acquired lands. Um, we are working on uh, also developing a clearer process for communicating what access is permitted or um, welcome on newly acquired lands 
you know, a lot, of, like I said, a lot of lands that require um, have strings that say public access is part of the deal. So um, we're going to continue to increase ramp up enforcement. Uh, we're going to continue to welcome recreation on lands. And um, the hope is that the planning and management that is in this strategy, as well as other um, work that the department is doing with our partners, will continue to um, address some of the some of the impacts that I think we're all concerned about. All right. Well, thank you, Joel. Um, I would just, especially for those that are on the phone and not able to see. Um, just point you towards our website, our main website, wdfw.wa.gov. Um, as the kind of the starting point, there's information there on the main website about our recreation strategy. It will point you to where, where the documents are. It will point you to the comment. Um, you can also, it will include the comment um, email, which is the number one zero for 10 one zero year rec strategy at publicinput.com. Um, and then the other email for you to know is um, Joel's email, which is J-O-E-L dot Sisolak, S-I-S-O A, I'm sorry, S-I-S-O-L-A-K at dfw.wa.gov. Um, so I think with that, we're gonna say thank you so much. Um, for joining us today. I appreciate the engagement. Look forward to um, any additional written comments and thoughts and further work together as we move forward um, in this body of work. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. And thanks Diane and Rachel for keeping this going.